All right. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, thank you for joining us for our second in a series of virtual weekly events um, to celebrate and raise awareness about the publication of Far Villages Welcome Essays for New and Beginner Poets. I'm going to hold it up if people can see. Here. <laughs> My name is Abayo Manu Masham. I am the anthologist editor um, at Black Lawrence Press, and I'll be serving as your host um, this evening. Um, today we have, this evening we have really wonderful poet essayists who will be talking about some essentials, um, they'll be talking about craft and some essentials of poetry, um, if we had to draw from one of our panelists' um, title. My hope um, for today's event is that we can have a good, honest, candid um, discussion about this wonderfully engaging thing we called poetry, which in a way has its own heartbeat, right? and it has its own personality and refuses to be caged and all those things. So while it's wonderfully engaging, it's also quite demanding, right? So I'm hoping that we can have a good conversation, honest conversation, and um, have some fun while we are doing it also. In terms of format, um, my hope is that we can have all the panelists discuss their essays for about 10 minutes or so. If you go over by a minute or two, we'll not hold it against you. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, as the panelists are talking, if you have something that comes to your mind and you think, oh my God, that, that's a question that I want to ask, feel free to just to jot it down in the chat box and throw it in there and I'll be sure to read it to everyone um, towards the end. So I'll go on ahead and read bios and then, and then we'll, we'll start. I'm gonna be reading the bios from, from the book. So Barbara Perry has an MFA from the Art Institute of Chicago. And she is an Illinois Arts Council Poetry Fellow. She was honored with the Whitney Museum of American Arts Independent Graduate Study Award, an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Fellowship, Honorable Mention, and she has had her video poems shown at the International Art Expo, Chicago, and the Olympia Media Exchange, Tokyo. She practices Buddhism, we unconditionally accept her mind, which she says is a good thing for any poet. Rob Carney, who is um, our second panelist, is originally from Washington State. He's the author of five books of poems. Most recently, the Book of Sharks, which will be which um, was released from Black Lars Press in 2018. And in 2014, he received the Robinson Jeffers Storehouse Foundation Award for Poetry. His work has appeared in Cave Wall, Columbia Journal, Dark, Dark Mountain, Uncivilized Poetic, which is 10, Sugar House Review, and many others. He is a professor of English and literature at Utah Valley University, and he lives in Salt Lake City uh, in Utah. Um, a third our third panelist is Michael Collins. And Michael Collins's poems have received pushcart nominations and appeared in more than 70 journals and magazines. He is also the author of the chat books, How to Sing When People Cut Off Your Head and Leave It 
floating in the water. <laughs> End, Harbor, Mandala, and the full length collections, some Mandala and Appearances, which was named one of the best in the poetry collection of 2017 by Kirkus Reviews. Our fourth panelist, um, not the least by any means, is David, David M. Harris. David M. Ha until 20, 2003, David M. Harris had lived more than 50 miles from New York City. Since then, he has moved to Tennessee, acquired a daughter and a classic MG, and gotten serious about poetry. All the they seem to be working out well, he said. His work has appeared in Pyrene's Fountain, Gargoyle, The Lab Letter, The Pedal Skull, and other places. His first collection of poetry, The, Re the Review Mirror, was published by Unsolicited, Unsolicited Press in 2013. Before getting an MFA and becoming a teacher, Harris worked in book publishing as an editor and other jobs in film production as, still, as a still photographer and script supervisor and for part of one summer in an ice cream hardening room. <laughs> he has published a novel, essays, short fiction, and reviews and has written two feature films. So to get us started, I'm thinking that we can begin with Rob Carney. Um, Rob Carney is having, there's, a, there's been a big storm where Rob Carney lives and he has limited um, availability to power. So we're going to open with him and we're going to let Rob Carney take it away. And now I think I've said too much and I've talked too long. So I'll keep quiet and stand to the side. Um, again, this is your show. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, so my essay in this book uh, is called A Field Guide to Poems in Three Parts. Um, but I want to start in the middle of the second part. Uh, that, that part is called Raccoon Versus. And so I'm just going to jump in in the middle. The other morning, I saw a baby raccoon and was glad that I did. So were Jen and Quentin and Jameson. And so were our neighbors who kept a kind of casual visual, vigil while he slept all day and evening in their tree. He'd been moving around under some ground cover vines in this spot where cats like to hide and ambush birds. So I figured he was just a cat until he strolled out onto the grass, this baby raccoon. I got my boys to come and look, but by then he'd gone up the tree walking up the branches the way that you and I would walk down the sidewalk. And that's where he was, still napping, when my wife Jen got home in the afternoon. If he were a bird, so what? But he wasn't, he was rare. And I think that's what a poem is too. This unexpected creature stepping out from under our language and climbing up a tree. And you there to notice. I like that definition, poems or raccoons. I like it for two reasons. First, because it's easy to remember. And second, because it doesn't make sense unless you're thinking in metaphor and imagery. I'll bet you that's how Williams felt after he'd written his famous wheelbarrow poem. I mean, I don't know for sure, but it doesn't seem impossible. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Thinking in imagery tells us plenty more, of course. For starters, the colors stand out in contrast, red and white and brown. There are chickens, so there's dirt around and gray. It's drizzling or used to be, so the sky above is overcast, but the sun's coming through enough to light up the raindrops. And even green, not pictured, but somewhere just outside the frame, since a place with chickens would have crops or a garden and likely some trees as a windbreak. And thinking in metaphor, it's telling us 
how much we need poems, those well-made language contraptions to bring us new encounters and experiences. A poem can haul a lot more than chicken feed and it's capable of taking daily crap loads and hauling them away at some kind of wheelbarrow. Now it's your turn. This is the third part. And to help you get started, here's an exercise. You might not get a finished poem your first try, but that's okay. It isn't nice to be greedy. If people ever tell me I'm a decent writer, I say no. What I am sometimes is a pretty good reviser. Anyway, what you won't have is just a blank page. So this is an exercise and it's called 11 Tasks. And I'll just read what the 11 rules are and then I will do one of my own poems that follows them as a kind of demo that, you know, I'm not just talking out of my, I use these, these kinds of exercises too. So 11 tasks, it's divided into obviously 11 rules, divided into two stanzas. Rule one is to start with something, doing something impossible. And rule two is, and then continue that picture for us. Rule three says, in the next lines, use two of your senses to describe where or when or how this is happening and mix it up. Uh, mix up the senses, use the synesthesia. Rule four is to describe yourself in a weird way. Rule five is make the I say something that he or she desires. And then in stanza two, rule six, make an assertion that sounds true but couldn't be. Seven, and now make a truer assertion. Eight, write a line describing another part of your setting using one or two of the senses. Nine, repeat the initial image in line one but change it in a noticeable way. In this combo, rule 10 and 11, I like this because sometimes it's hard to think of a title and this is a, a way to come up with one. Rule 10 says, finally, write a line that continues the story or mood, 11, but cross it out and make it the title of the poem instead. So here's one of my own poems following these rules pretty faithfully. It's called, now that's what I'm talking about. My cat has swallowed the year's last moon. It stares out gold through his eyes. All night, he carries it inside him like a dream. And he's eaten three constellations, so he's warm now as whiskey with their light. He's a cat. He takes whatever pleases him. He gulps the very heart of the earth, its own red center, then finishes with a yawn. At last, the earth's heart settled down, purring. Outside, it's winter and a cold wind stirring. Above that, beyond, more cold to come, no question. But not for me, not tonight. Inside, if he stirs at all, my cat stirs like a furnace. Here, on the bed, between my feet. So just quickly to braid the two together so you see that uh, the rules really do get followed. Uh, at least loosely. What I said was you need to start with something doing something impossible. My cat has swallowed the year's last moon. And then to continue that picture, it stares out gold through his eyes. All night he carries it inside him like a dream. Rule three was to go on and say when and where it's happening and to mix up the senses. So I kept the mixing up the senses thing, but I just sort of rolled from rule two into rule three and just kept going with the continuation of the picture. So I said, and he's eaten three constellations, so he's warm now as whiskey with their light. He's a cat. This is rule four and rule five. He's a cat. He takes whatever pleases him. Now I had said you have to sort of describe uh, yourself in a weird way. Instead, because I've been writing third person, uh, I just stuck with the cat right? Um, he's a cat. He takes whatever pleases him. Instead of saying the word desire, I just went ahead and showed desire, taking whatever pleases you. In the next stanza, it says, make an untrue, so, uh, make an untrue assertion that sounds true. And so I did this. He gulps the very heart of the earth, its own red center, then finishes with a yawn. And then it says to make a truer assertion. So I did at last the earth's heart settled down purring. And then it says, describe another part of the setting. 
Outside it's winter and a cold wind stirring, above that beyond, more cold to come, no question. But not for me, not tonight. And then to return to line one and choose some other kind of way of describing the scene. Outside it's winter and a cold wind stirring, above that beyond, more cold to come, no question, but not for me, not tonight, inside. If he stirs at all, my cat stirs like a furnace here on the bed between my feet. Now that's what I'm talking about. And you cross it out and that becomes your title. And it's kind of a cool generative little machine. But I'm not promising, like I say in the, in the essay, I'm not promising you're gonna get a finished poem, but you won't have a blank page and you will have a start of something uh, that you're interested in because most of us are interested in things that are impossible but are happening. Another way to, to, to do this is to say um, you're stuck. So for five minutes, you have to write all the things that you're doing. Uh, and they may be really, really boring things, right? And then uh, when you run out of stuff, it's, you know, I'm sitting at my table, uh, I have a cup of coffee, um, you know, outside there's a windstorm and so on and so on and so on. Well, then you have to write about all the things that you wish were happening. I wish that the storm was caused by, you know, I don't know, what? dinosaur sneezes. And then instead of I wish, you say there's a windstorm outside caused by dinosaur sneezes. And now you've made it uh, an assertion. It's something that's not true, but you've made it true and you're in and you get to see what's going to happen next. There was a time long ago, and I've never forgotten it, this poet Marvin Bell, he wrote a poem and he said, what I really like is if a first line happens, I know it's a good line because it's going to compel me to write a second. And he had this poem to his wife, it's called To Dorothy. And the first line that popped to his head was, you are not beautiful exactly. And he loved that because it surprised him uh, and he knew that he had to write a second line fast or he was dead. And the second line was, you are beautiful in exactly. And then he knew he was in because he could imagine his wife saying, well, what does that mean? And then he had to use images as examples. You plant a tree by the mulberry and the mulberry by the house. So close in the quiet night, the limbs brush the windows and will not let me sleep. And that's all he wants, right? And that's all I want. And hopefully what other poets want too, is a thing that captivates you and gets you started. So that's, that's really what my essay is about, along with, for free, if we were in the, if we were in Cajun country, they call it lanyap, a little something extra that you didn't even ask for. There's an exercise there for you to try it too. Is that cool? All right, thank you. I wish I knew, thank you so much for that, that was lovely. Yeah, no worries. Um, I wish I knew how to do that emoji with the clap. Like, I don't ah, I know. No, I could see you. That was I, good. I, and I know that if I begin to look for it, I'm going to just break Zoom. So I don't yeah. want to be the person that breaks Zoom. So I, I want to be the person who breaks Zoom. <laughs> I'm just going to clap and do this. Thank you. So you know what I'm doing. Um, next. Um, Barbara Perry, somewhere, somehow, where, when I grew up in Nigeria, English is not my first language, but that I heard people say things like ladies first. I don't know what it means, um, but we had to go with Rob first because of his power situation. So we're going to come to you next. Um, please take it away. Thank you. <laughs> OK, unmute. Good. That's a really old fashioned idea. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, it's everybody's first, you know. Um, um, I was just gonna kind of read straight forward here and um, interject here and there. Um, I chose to uh, take the topic of uh, the muse um, and uh, exercises for inviting the muse is the name of uh, my piece. Um, and uh, there's a lot to say about Muse. Uh, the, it's a root in the word amusement. So if you, can, if you keep that in mind, that is kind of a way to approach 
making your work is to allow yourself to be amused by uh, whatever comes forth. So exercises for inviting the muse. There is often the complaint that you can't find the time to fit in some writing. But Gabriel Gutting wrote a book length poem while driving his car from normal Illinois to Providence, Rhode Island, and back every weekend to see his daughter. Sure, there were lots of highway vistas in it. However you, do, however you do, it doesn't much matter. So set your alarm clock a half hour earlier, go to a dollar store and buy more socks and underwear so you can skip laundry this weekend, sit in your car in the parking garage instead of traffic, give yourself the time and you will be mixing your mind with that time and place, and that will be a great start. So um, uh, there's a variety of techniques and um, suggestions in here. And this one is called, You Are Just the Scribe Trying to Keep Up. This is a, more or less a suggestion here. Never judge what you have just written. It is not time for your editor's voice to be listened to. It is only time for an uncensored creative gush. This is a moment of complete liberation of the mind's impulses, so let it rip. Give yourself complete permission to write the weirdest, saddest, most nihilistic, confusing, or most Pollyannish ever poem. By letting yourself and your literary ideals be a desire for something pithy or soulful or epic, Letting go, I'm sorry, by letting go of yourself and your literary ideals, be it a desire for something pithy or soulful or epic, you can blow the doors off any self-consciousness and create a potent and surprising experience. Sit back and enjoy the ride of no expectations. You are doing this to generate possible poetic material, not a final product. You are just the scribe trying to keep up with the barrage of uncensored thoughts, images, and phrases. So uh, here's a technique, <clears throat> it's number two in the essay, called swivel points. If what you have just written has some zest or promise, but is like a stew that, you, that is missing some spice, write the missing spice on another sheet of paper. For instance, if the piece is too clawing or sweet, you might write sour, biting, sarcastic, or cruel. Then to set up this new swivel point, Use a word or phrase that makes room for this, such as, but, unfortunately, or in reality, etc. Or you can use any number of negating idioms, such as, who cares? Beats me. Give me a break. So what? Etc. To ask a question. Uh, or to make a retort about this piece of writing. Then write your bitter answer. This works to inject a surprise or twist to the poem, which it can be like hitting pay dirt in poetry. And um, I once heard of Cambridge physicists say that we receive 150 million impulses of information a second yet can only be conscious of perhaps seven in a moment. So there's a lot that the uh, subconscious can be tapped into uh, for, and um, that is what we're utilizing. We're, we're just jumping in and letting things come up from subconscious places here. Um, so onward here to uh, so you have this storehouse, this richness, and here's what I am, uh, I'm calling it psychic energy, and there's more about that in here, but, uh, so it says, so believe in your innate inner richness, allow yourself the sense of being on vacation where time and space is yours to fully sink into. You are rich in resources. What a one, what wonderful, sad, frustrated, fulfilled, painful, acerbic, 
or silly, etc. feelings can you allow up? If what you have allowed up holds some psychic energy for you, then the next phrase, image, or piece of poetic logic will automatically come up from this. If your left brain tries to interfere, telling you something is too silly, violent, grotesque, improper, verbose, etc., ignore that part of your brain, just as you would some wacko yelling at you from a YouTube clip. They're not even in the same room as you, not even the same world. Your world of indulging in the spontaneity and impulse of mind on page. They have nothing to do with this world of writing by the seat of your pants, accepting everything and anything that comes up and following the energy. Following the energy is a very important thing. Um, it's, it's just knowing where you've got that uh, sense that, you know, something is sparking and, and to, to keep, keep yourself focused on that versus um, losing sight of um, what's really exciting to you. And, and sometimes the, the, the left brain kind of gets in there and wants to sort of like stop that kind of crazy ha happiness, you know, it's just, it's, it's too out there or what have you, but you have to totally ignore that aspect. Um, it's, it's a part of your mind that's just trying to keep you safe. <laughs> it's a funny thing, but you know, um, we do these kind of things and um, we're, we're trying to sort of get back to our original sort of childish self. And then this next part says a little about that, I think. Um, so like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, you've always had the power to get back to your true home, that deep self, that vast present and past sensory data of all you are. What you had to learn was to trust your inner Kansas, not rely on externalities to point the way. Monkeys, witches, helpful little people, none of these could take you to the source of your creative depths. In fact, the path that your creative self takes was potentially shackled from mid-childhood on. I heard an advanced Buddhist teacher once say that around six to nine years old, a certain spirit-like quality goes underground. So that is what we must do. So what we must do is begin to trust our inner sense of things as we did in our early childhood and make that connection strong again. So, yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, there's a lot of other little um, exercises and, and techniques in here. Um, the other thing I, I would say is that um, we, uh, we, we uh, have a, a part of us that um, is almost like an actor, you know, when I, I was saying in the book that, you know, do, do you think that uh, the guy that Brad Pitt played in um, Fight Club was, was Brad Pitt? It, it, no, he, he was accessing sort of all his inner sort of impressions and, um, and, and, and drawing that out and, and making sort of for a, uh, making a, a better um, connection to those things that they were sort of in, interior. Uh, it's not his real personality, but there's all these things inside that you can um, allow out and just play with them. Don't suppress them and allow them to show up. And, and, a, and a good way to do that is to um, almost exaggerate the feeling. Be, be, um, be that guy in Fight Club or whatever it is. Be, be a, um, anything that sort of like uh, strikes you at the moment that is an image that comes up for you. And mind that deeply um, and don't worry about, um, you know, if it's improper or, or not you or what have you, all these things sort of do connect to you. Any, anything that you can touch, um, uh, any, any image that comes up or what have you is, is full of potential for that sort of, um, expansion um at any rate um that's that's sort of the gist of my 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 essay thank you so much barbara i really appreciate that that was wonderful 
um, as you were saying that towards the end, I was reminded about reminded of the end of your essay, where you have something along the lines of um, it begins with a faint line or something like that towards the end. Yeah. Of the essay, something along those lines. Yes, an image is very faint at first, and um, it is something that um, you don't even understand sometimes if it's um, if it's if it's an image or a sense, it's just something sort of, sometimes it kind of keeps reoccurring and you're just like, I'm not writing about, you know, paint cans today, you know, I'm writing about, you know, world love or whatever, you know, but this image keeps coming up. You, you just, you just let it up and it sort of reveals a whole uh, way of speaking about what you, where you were going in the first place. Um, yeah, that faint, very faint image sometimes can be persistent. Yeah. I want to take a pause here to say that, um, to remind people that we have um, the book on sale on the Black Learn Express um, website. And our um, executive editor is going to post the website in, the, in our chat um, box down below. And also, um, Again, if questions pop up, um, we appreciate the comments. Um, but if you have questions that pop up into your mind as people are talking, we encourage you to um, drop those questions in. We'll add them to the questions that we have prepared over here. Um, we'll go next to David M. Harris. And David, please take it away. Well, my essay started as a letter to a, a friend of mine whom I've known since the early 70s sometime. And uh, it was only about 15 years ago that I discovered she had been writing poetry all along. And uh, when she found out that I was getting serious about it, she asked for some advice. And that was the, uh, the very earliest, roughest first draft of what became this essay. Um, it's not a craft essay in the usual sense. Uh, if you're old enough to remember the film, uh, The Paper Chase, which at one time was very popular about students in their first year of law school, Professor Kingsfield tells them, I'm not here to teach you the law. I'm here to teach you how to think like lawyers. And it, it occurs to me that that's really what this is about. So I'm just going to read the first uh, eight minutes of it or so. Many people decide, usually in the first two years of high school, that they are going to be poets. A small portion of them goes on to write some poetry. Most of those never go on to write anything that is of any interest outside of a small circle of friends. These people dream of being poets in about the same way that I dreamed of being a pitcher for the New York Yankees, concentrating on the being, not the doing. Frankly, I'm not nearly as interested in people who want to be poets as I am in people who want to write poetry. Any working writer has had countless encounters of the I've always wanted to write a novel, screenplay, poetry collection variety. And I've always wanted to play for the Yankees or litigate a case in the Supreme Court, except that I haven't been prepared to do what is necessary to get there. There may be a gift for poetry which some people have and others don't, but great or even good poetry doesn't come from just spilling your emotions onto the page as you did in high school. Part of the job of poetry is making the right decisions and party, part of it is learning what you need to know before you can be a good artist. <coughs> and part of it, of course, is just practice. Malcolm Gladwell said that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to make you an expert in anything. Gladwell is only right if your practice is directed intelligently. If you just keep practicing your scales for 10,000 hours, you still won't be an expert pianist. You have to deal with, deal with other essential issues as well. So here, in no particular order, are some of the essential issues you have to deal with if you want to be a working poet. Purpose. Decide why you are writing poetry. If it is for your own private purpose, such as therapy, then all the rest of this is irrelevant. All you need to do is go through the process of writing and get your work on paper. If you want other people to read it, that is for it to be published, then you have to start worrying about craft. I'll mention a few useful books as we go along. But if you aren't interested in publishing, your job is finished when your last word is written. 
And if you want to get published, it helps if you have some good idea of why you want that and what you expect from it. If you expect wealth and fame, you can find the name of a therapist in the yellow pages. Fame and fortune aren't part of poetry, unless you're a dying child, a movie star, or Billy Collins. My publisher told me that she would be thrilled if my book sold 200 copies. So far, it hasn't. Do you just think it would be cool to see your name in print, or do you feel you have something to say? Or are you going to write no matter what, and you might as well try to share what you produce? This actually goes to the core of your relationship with writing. Before you can really produce what you want, you must know what you want. As obvious as this may sound, many new writers just start putting words on the page or on the computer screen without the slightest idea of their real intentions other than to be a writer. It may be true, as Red Smith is reported to have said, that you simply sit down at the typewriter, open your veins, and bleed. But even that only works if you have some idea of what you are trying to write, and some idea of how to manipulate the words to get there. Starting to write and hoping for inspiration is the fast road to bad poetry. If all you want is to see your name in print, you are fortunate to live in the age of self-publishing and blogs, which are, after all, online self-publishing. You can post your work and send links to your friends or have a few copies printed and hand them to friends and families without worrying about the intermediation of an editor. Other people, of course, want the validation that comes from an editor's selection and the somewhat greater visibility that goes with an established journal, whether in electronic or dead tree form. What you want will determine how you choose to present your work to the world. None of these choices is intrinsically better or worse than any other. They suit different people differently. But you should know what your choice is so you can act on it. Form. Not all poems need to have rhyme or meter or a classical structure, but why not have these tools in your kit? You may come up with an idea that would benefit from being cast in sonnet form or Curiel or Sestina. And you can't take advantage of that if you don't know those forms and what they're good for. There are two arguments against knowing the forms. The first is that they're old fashioned. This works only if the people in the argument haven't read the new formalists, Mark Jarman, Molly Peacock, Dana Joya, Marilyn Hacker, Elizabeth Alexander, Andrew Hudgens, and many more, who are writing excellent formal poetry right now as you read this or as you listen to it. The second argument is that it's much harder to write formal poetry than free verse. This one is true, but it's valid only if you think poetry is supposed to be easy. Good poetry is only very rarely easy. And the truth is that the traditional forms of poetry or even new invented ones aren't really all that hard. Mostly all they take is work and practice and the practice can be fun. I worked my way through Stephen Fry's The Ode Less Traveled, which is informative and witty. This is the same Fry from Peter's Friends or the BBC Jeeves and Worcester programs, and came out with a notebook of formally correct, but mostly uninspired verse and a few ideas, and the skill to use meter at least when a poem needs it. I'm still weak on rhyme. I can make the lines rhyme, but not in an interesting way but I can recognize most of the standard forms when I run into them, and I have at least a rough idea of when I might want to try one of them. For example, if you want to write a love poem or something that plays against the idea of a love poem, a sonnet is an interesting form to try, since it began as a form dedicated to love poetry. Edna St. Vincent Millay made good use of this in sonnets such as I Being Born a Woman and Distressed. Many sonnets are known by their first lines. Forms with repetitions, such as villanelles and pantoums and, to some extent, sestinas, can echo how our minds return to ideas or phrases, sometimes transforming them through repetition. Theodore Retke's The Waking is a particularly fine example of the villanelle, in which he makes use of some slight variations on the form. You can also make variations, but you must understand the form before you can play with it. Each form has a history and a function. They aren't arbitrary, except for a few of the more recently invented ones. Forms call on you to respond to them, to stretch yourself into new skills and new ideas. Looking for the right word to fit the meter or rhyme of a formal poem can lead you off into an unexpected direction. And as a poet, you should be open to accident. 
And you don't have to write every poem in a received form. You can write some free verse, some blank verse, and some strict forms. Most of my own work is free verse, but some of my best and best received poems have been in forms. Now, there are some people who argue that any piece of text that doesn't have meter and rhyme isn't poetry. They're just as mistaken as those who think that formal poetry is only for the fogies. The battle against free verse was lost long ago, arguably with the publication of Leaves of Grass and certainly no later than the Imagists about a century ago. A good reference book on formal poetry is The Book of Forms by Louis Turco. Miller Williams's Patterns of Poetry is also fine. Done. Thank you so much for that lovely, that lovely presentation. I was trying to type in here. I'm not very tech savvy, everybody, so forgive me. I'm trying to type in something. I don't know. Looks like it went through. How uh, when you mentioned as poets, we should be open to accidents. Um, I, I mentioned that I love that very much. Um, uh, poetry without accidents sometimes um, loses itself. Um, so we're going to go to Michael, uh, Michael Collins. And Michael Collins um, was going to bring us home, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, so um, I wasn't quite sure how to actually read this. Um, there are two voices in it, um, one who's the, the teaching voice and another one that just kind of interrupts uh, for various reasons that voice can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Um, but the main things we'll go through are just the kind of, and, and this is where the other voice plays in, just demystification of writing process and organic kind of ways of composition. And also thinking of the form of a poem that you're reading as a process to write another one. So. Hopefully any of that will come through. Uh, it's on page 87 if you have the book there. Um, I use model poems or I was using model poems when I was writing these. Um, so I'm gonna read the poem first, just for if no other reason, at least you get to hear one good thing uh, from me. And I reference it without quoting. So. If you have the book, it'll help you to look at it. If not, I'm gonna read it and you know, do your best. So this is uh, what my son's haircut taught me about flying, which is from uh, Diane Seuss's first collection, It Blows You Hollow, um, from a long time ago. The beautician's name is Robin Beebe. Wonder if her family was from down around our way. There was a BB farm where a sheep gave birth to a lamb with two heads. This was back during the Civil War before medical science could have kept a thing like that alive. They stuffed it looking in two directions. Not many in this town talk about the connection between the lamb with the one body and two heads and the Civil War when the country was nearly split in two. It's not a town for making sense of things like that. Stuff it put it in the museum, go on with your life. When Robin Beebe cut my son's hair and all of the curls went floating to the floor, it surprised me that I thought of these things. Wishing he could have two heads, one for him and one for me. One with a real boy haircut, sideburns, straight line across the back so he can feel good about himself. And one with the curls left alone, soft down his back like a little animal. We must fly in an airplane on Thursday from up here in the cold to the warm south. The air is a place I do not want to be. I wish I had two bodies and could leave one behind here on the earth, sitting out in the cold cornfields watching the sky. But you can't have it two ways. That's kind of a town motto. Let the air do its business. Let Robin Beebe use her beauty academy schooling. Give your son to her. Her scissors are sharp as a taxidermist, and she has a smile on her face. 
How's my little man today, she asks. There was a time that lamb lay limp in someone's arms, breathing with two mouths. So then the actual writing that I did begins. I like this poem for beginning poets because it flies in the face of some prominent myths about poetry. For starters, it lacks several traditional and often stereotypical elements of poetry. And this is where the other voice comes in and yells bullets. That yes, italicized sidekick, welcome to the class, try to be on time in the future. I was stuck in a line. Dude, we're in a book. I know, there are so many lines, it's hard to know which one to be in. Of course, here are your bullets. Line breaks, rhyme, flowery language that sounds like the poet came directly from high tea with William Shakespeare and the Queen. On the other hand, there are all of the things the poem does to make us, to make, sorry, to make use of that are not stereotypically poetic. More bullets? Sure, why not? I think I'm going to call them eggs from now on, okay? It's a metaphor. I shatter paradigms. It's kind of my thing. All right, well, you do you, my friend. At any rate, the poem uses the speaker's natural daily voice. You might even say she highlights local dialect. Stories apparently from her own life, nothing grandiose or hard to imagine. The speaker's own not overtly organized subjective associative thought process. And that's the one that we're kind of highlighting as a part of the form of the poem that becomes a process tool. I'm willing to bet that we each have these ingredients hidden away or maybe not so hidden in our own psyches. So we each must be able to make poems in this way. And tacos, the other voice is kind of obsessed with food and various other things that we do when we say we're writing instead of writing. Yes, but well, okay. I would like to focus on the associative thought process for a minute first because it's a really humble yet fascinating tactic for a poet to allow a reader to see them thinking with all the messiness and leaping here and there that goes along with it. We barely begin the story about the speaker's son's haircut when a question intrudes. By associating Rob and Beebe with the Beebe's from the speaker's past, we're diverted from the Beebe farm, from there to the strange two-headed lamb, its period, the Civil War, and the image of it eventually stuffed facing in two directions. That's a lot of mental leaps in a few lines, and we haven't even heard about this haircut the title has promised, and we're not even finished with the associations. We, we proceed to connect the two-headed lamb with the Civil War splitting the country, and this leads us to the communal personality of the speaker's hometown, which avoids such complicated topics, preferring to stuff it put it in a museum and go on with your life. Do you see what I mean about how the poem mirrors the messy ways in which we often think? Doesn't it seem that the unanswered questions, associations with memories and overpowering emotions guide the progressions of our consciousness as often as, or more often than, you know, logic? They can't answer you. That's what the margins are for. Oh, right. When do we make tacos? Dude, seriously. Let's get back to the poem and the ways in which it mirrors some of the ways we think when our thoughts are free to wander. In other words, this presentation of human consciousness would not be as applicable when we're directly focused on a task of some sort. Then we think logically. Rather, this is how our minds work when we are in a more meditative state, sitting quietly, drinking coffee in the morning, maybe commuting home from work or all the way to the East Coast. Cutting vegetables, taking a shower, arranging the garden gnomes. Yes, good examples. When we're not directing our thinking, it tends to proceed along less linear channels. One thing reminds us of another and another and another and another. The interesting thing about this is that we sometimes make unforeseen connections as our minds associate one thing with another. Connections that are logical thinking 
might ignore or bypass. In other words, writing associatively allows the writing to surprise us. Or perhaps it's better to say, this kind of writing allows our deeper selves to surprise us through the act of writing. And I'll kind of end there, I think. It, it, it winds around discussing the rest of the poem and then there's an exercise at the end, but we've kind of, I feel like the other presenters have covered actual association in writing exercises um, in different ways that maybe I don't need to beat a dead horse. So thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Should I mute myself? <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so again, for those who may, may have joined us in the middle of it, we're talking to the authors um, whose, whose S's are featured in um, Far Villages. And here we're talking about the second chapter dealing with craft and that's titled Some Essentials of Poetry um, taken from, I think Michael Collins' title, I forget, oh no. Um, let me see, I'm going to cheat here. David, David M. Aris's title, Some Essentials of Poetry. So um, we're going to open it up to questions. To um, We're going to go first to one of the questions posted here on in the chat box. So I'm going to read it aloud. So um, are any of the poets reading tonight have some trouble writing during this time of COVID? It seems like there should be a lot of material, but I've been having trouble. Would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, uh, I haven't been writing much about COVID. I have been writing. Um, if anything, I'm coming back to my writing practice after a, a long dry spell. And one of the poems was in fact about being locked down. Uh, but I think if you're ri a writer, what, what you do is write. And that's kind of the definition. Um, you don't have to write about what is going on immediately around you. Uh, I very rarely write anything about current events unless they remain current for three or four years, and then I've had time to think about them. Um, the poet David Kirby uh, once told me that he, he writes a poem in 15 or 20 minutes, but only after he's thought about it for 10 years. So I, I also have to let things sink in and uh, I have to meditate on them subconsciously for, for mm -hmm. at least a few years before I'm ready to write about them. So that's why it's so little about COVID for me. I've tried to write something um, because as the questioner said, it's like, it seems like there should be a lot of material there. There is a lot of material. There's a certain lot of, um, a lot to disentangle or a lot to, um, you know, we are so not distracted in some ways that you think we could go deeper. And, and, and in a way, um, I feel like, I have, but it, 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 it hasn't exactly shown up in the writing either. Um, I'm, I agree with David. Um, it, it takes sort of a longer time for some uh, of this material to sort of um, bubble up or what have you. Um, or I should say more like uh, bake down to something solid, uh, um, which doesn't mean you shouldn't try though i mean you never know and that's the whole thing you can keep doing it and then one day something will pop out that's that's you just have the 
commitment to do this and you sit down and you do it and you know you settle yourself down and um try not to go with the head because a lot of the covid sort of craziness gets you up here and i really believe that poetry has to kind of come from your body you're 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 not listening too much to the brain here you're sort of like um relaxing and getting your cues from um deeper sensing and when you do that's where images come from that's where a phrase will come from that's where a sense of something comes from and uh then you you go from there um so that is yeah i i i've definitely been trying but nothing's happened yet other things sort of are happening though so it's just not my topic i guess at the moment <laughs> Um, if I can jump in, as an editor, I can attest to the fact that a lot of people are writing about COVID. Yeah. Uh, we had an open reading period during the month of June. So, you know, we're thinking June 1st to June 30th, you know, we were really only deeply in this uh, pandemic for a few months when people were submitting their manuscripts. And we really did receive a surprising number of submissions, and I'm still working my way through them right now, a surprising number of submissions about COVID. And, uh, and to your point, Barbara, a lot of them seem uh, unfinished. <laughs> a lot of them seem, it's, it's such a new topic. And it, it, um, it, not that there isn't value in the, in the work that we're reading, but, um, but at least among the ones that I've read so far, they don't feel uh, like complete manuscripts that are really and truly ready for the world. So, and that also goes back to the, the David Kirby uh, quote about, you know, writing a poem in 15 minutes after, you know, dreaming it up. <laughs> I have just finished the first poem that I've been satisfied about writing about 9-11. <laughs> about it, but I never was satisfied. This time I am satisfied and has nothing to do. I guess it sort of does to do it because this is sort of a national time of unrealness. And, and I haven't written as much generally just because everything is so unreal. I've also been distracted by a project that has taken me 10 years to complete. I have 30 acres and about a third of it is meadow. And for the first time in 10 years, I've been able to have the whole thing mowed and bailed. And that's been made more major than writing, although I have been writing some, but not as much. But I think it's just this thinking process and thinking time uh, is why. Anyway, that's all. I appreciate that that was my question and I appreciate your comments on that. I've found that, uh, I mean, I've been writing poetry for a very long time and I paint as well. And I've been doing far more painting than I have been doing writing. And I, I'm not sure why. Um, I just am going with it. But, um, but you know, I, I just, I found also that I think part of it has to do with not going out of the house much. Uh, I actually went to the dentist um, and I was thrilled because I had like an outside experience and got a poem out of it. So maybe that's part of it, but I, I appreciate all of your, um, your comments on that. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, this brings me to the question. I was, I was able to write down um, a question for, for each person that I'm hoping that we can all have something of um, a conversation with each question. So this is from rereading David M. Harris's um, essay. And in listening to you guys, um, it's causing me to really think about about how beginning writers, and here I'm thinking about myself, find the ending of a poem or being done with a poem or having the idea of a finished poem so seductive oh, while not wanting to remain in that space um, that requires preparation, to use David M. Harris's language, that requires preparation, long study, the demanding work, this given the poem space, but rather 
being done with the poem. Look at me, it took me 10 minutes to write this poem. Look at how great I am, <laughs> sentiment. So I guess my question is, what is, why do many beginning poets find the ending of a poem so seductive? Because they want it to be over. Writing is at its best really hard work. And if you can say, okay, this poem is done. Okay, good. Now I can go feed the dog, whatever. Um, dinner. Um, the hard part for me is not finishing the poem. It's figuring out what the real ending is after I've finished it and then writing the rest of the poem. Uh, I was at uh, Sewanee a few years ago and uh, B.H. Fairchild read a poem about Mickey Mantle and uh, how his father kind of came across him playing amateur baseball in Oklahoma. And he got up to the point in the poem where this enormous kid who has been pounding the, the snot out of the ball uh, introduces himself. And I thought that was the end of the poem. And then Fairchild went on and wrote what was the real ending of the poem, which was the question, why did the pitcher on the other team keep throwing something he could hit? Why did he keep pitching to him and not just walk him? I mean, this is, for those of you who don't know baseball, this doesn't make much sense. Um, but that was, the, that was the moment when I suddenly realized when you think you've got to the end of the poem, you probably haven't, or I probably haven't. I can't, you know, anytime you try to model your process after someone else, you're making a huge mistake. Um, <clears throat> but that first ending is so seductive because, oh, okay, I've finished this sucker. What do, you, what do you guys think about ending on an image as opposed to kind of a statement, you know, like more ending on an image? If it works for the poem, dandy. If it doesn't, it's a huge mistake. <laughs> I was going to say, is it a good image? <laughs> well, because hopefully. If, it, if it's a good image, that might be fine. But um, I have a friend uh, named Scott. And he's a writer too. And he, he says that, that uh, well, this was recently in an interview. He, he pointed out that, you know, how many, how many poems end with uh, birds flying off into the distance? Uh, you know, lots of them. I mean, and then he said, how many jokes end with birds inexplicably having done nothing flying off into the distance? And he said, none, uh, except for, you know, uh, one where, uh, there's a, a bird at the end of this joke where the, the guy asks his uh, shrink, uh, what do I have to do to get this guy off my ass, right? So <laughs> as long as there's some sort of purpose to it, a statement, yeah. image, whatever, but if there isn't, if it's just, I've run out of things to say and now I'll do oh. what I think is the profound gesture, then you just wanted to finish. Now, probably you'll go back and, and work on it later, right? But uh, the ending is important. And, and I, I don't understand why uh, academics seem to be uh, lately, at least a tribe of them, opposed to poetic closure. They wanted to kind of go, ah, uh, you know, and then dot, dot, dot out. The, and I can't stand that at readings because you have no signal that the poem is over, right? Um, I think that the ending matters and it can end, you know, well with a statement or poorly. It depends on the statement. It can end excellently with an image or not, depending on the image. But ultimately, if, if you feel like, I don't know if this is great, then you read it out loud. And if it seems incomplete, then it probably is. If you read it out loud to another person, they're like, 
well, why'd you end it like that? Well, then you know <laughs> that you didn't nail the ending, right? You got to stick the landing the way anybody would in uh, gymnastics or whatever. I just want to say I do have a poem that ends in an ellipsis, but it's a poem about indecision. So, so I think <laughs> it's justified. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I know we have about just just about twenty minutes left um, for for this event. Um, it's supposed to take last an hour and a half. Am I right, um, Diane Gettle? Some, something like that. Sure, but I mean, it's not like you know, it's a hard and fast ninety minutes, and <laughs> no one's allowed out of the room until we finish. Class. So whatever happens, happens. We're just here to have a good time. So. So speaking about um, images and stuff, I'm, I'm gonna direct my question, my, my next question to Rob Carney. So in, I have it written down here. Um, so in your essay, part of what you talk about also is the importance of a racial metaphor, which can oftentimes lead us into um, unexpected um, spaces, um, surprising in places and places, right? And this is anthologies for the beginner poet, the new poet. Um, how soon should new poets start thinking and embracing metaphor? Uh, they probably already were, or they wouldn't want to make poems themselves. I think that we're usually drawn to trying something that we really, really like. And if we're readers, and we're probably you know, people who really like metaphor, or would we wouldn't be, you know, dabbling or hanging around dabblers. I mean, at least that's how I felt about it. Um, because I liked reading and made me want to write, one of the things that's attractive to me about reading is somebody's skillful use of language, figurative language maybe uh, especially. And so I think metaphor is kind of like, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's the hook, isn't it? Isn't that what draws us in? more than well maybe not maybe some people only want to advance their really really good space story plot but um i mean that's you know a, a weird thing to to do as a as a genre writer because i think that isn't the whole point of science fiction that it's speaking metaphorically not about some distant part of space but about earth right now metaphorically so i for me go for it man i mean do the metaphor thing right away pronto asap because that's the fun and you, you want it to be fun. I was wondering if any of our panelists want to add to that or we could go to the next person too if that's okay. I think Rob nailed it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That was, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, Barbara, I'm gonna come to you I'm going to come to you next, and this is something of um, a personal question that I'm hoping that all our panelists will be able to take up also. So one of the reasons why I love your essay so much is it addresses the kind of sentiment that many writers have, and I am not exempt from this, this notion that I have no time to write, right? I, I, I never do. I never have time to write. It's, it's just my life is so crazy. And, but, you're, but in your essay, you say, yes, you do. Um, what are you doing when you're sitting at the gas station doing nothing? What are you doing um, when you're sitting down outside doing nothing? Um, that TV show that you're watching ninth time in a row, um, isn't that a time that you can carve out some writing space? So the, you clearly s argue this and you talk about what people can do to get them to write during those spaces when they've carved out time for themselves. So I guess my question is from what you've observed, either from other writers or yourself, what are some of the big obstacles um, that prevent people from writing? Mm -hmm. Well, their mind, <laughs> mostly. Um, oh, uh, and how can they manage those obstacles? Sure. Well, you know, like a friend once said, you know, 
if you don't have a schedule for something, you just won't do it. So sometimes it's very helpful to just be first thing in the morning. Actually, I've read a lot of uh, things to, that sort of support that. You know, your mind in the morning is kind of much more facile in connection to subconscious material. So morning is a really great time. Um, however, whenever you can make that time, you're always in a in a place that's going to like i was saying your mind will just mix with that space whatever is presented will connect to something inside already that you are um uh that you already have um accessible to yourself i'm seeing linda and I, am i supposed to i'm i'm sorry <laughs> i heard her paperwork and then i was like what's going on I'm, I'm not the greatest on Zoom here, I think. But anyway, um, I, I think that having uh, either a, a commitment to a time uh, where you make a new time, such as, hey, um, it's the weekend and I had all these things I had to actually catch up on, or no, I'm actually going to um, prioritize this somehow. Uh, you know you can. Um, so, you know, you don't have a clean kitchen sink and you would rather have some poems. I mean, it, it really is just a matter of sort of um, being light with yourself about it. Um, you sit down with your journal and you start saying this, you know, maybe all that negative like uh, self-criticism is there and it starts out where you're, I'm not doing the dishes and I really feel like I should be, but you know what, um, the air is coming through the windows and I'm relaxing and I'm feeling like calling an old friend and then and then slowly you're moving into a more contemplative state. I, I find that actually meditation helps a little bit, just a little slowing the mind down thing and and separating yourself from the chatter in your brain and getting into a deeper place and in, in, in a place where there's that well of um, constantly um, available imagery and um, inner sensing, you know? And that, that is actually how I um, sort of approach it, you know? Um, if, I, if I calm myself down, <laughs> and I usually have more connected, deeper feelings that I can sense. And, and, and so therefore, you know, making just making a certain set a rule to sort of like you know at lunch you walk and have this seat you always sit at at a cafe or wherever it is we're not doing that so much anymore but you know um know that you're going to make a commitment to sit and do that you know so one of the big obstacles for so thank you for that i appreciate yeah. that very yeah. much I'm hoping that other people and some of our other panelists can talk about this more also. Um, one of the big obstacles for me is when I've been gone from writing for a while, I find that I'm impatient with myself. Um, I think back to where I was when things were moving, things were clicking, and it all made sense. But now I've been gone away from it for a while, and I'm so impatient with myself that I would rather be ironing my shirt the third time in a row than actually sitting down there and working through the kinks to to help me get started. Is this true for, for you, a panelist also? And if so, how do you manage it when you've been gone from writing for so long? How do you get back um, to where you were before? Anyone else wants to talk? Well, um, something that works for me, I do occasionally have dry spells. And I think I mentioned before, I'm just coming out of one now. Um, I write in a little notebook, which fits in my pocket. Uh, I know other people who do their first drafts on their phone, whatever it is. Get in the habit of writing in something you can carry with you and have it with you. Uh, for example, today I spent four hours doing volunteer work. Uh, 
And a lot of that time I wasn't really very busy. So I pulled out my little notebook and I worked on a poem. You know, I had four minutes before the next person came in that I had to deal with. So, okay, I, that's long enough to write two or three lines that might be worth saving. Uh, you get a little work done there. Um, I, I once got a bit of advice from a, a much better writer than myself. He said, we, we make two kinds of decisions in life. We make micro decisions. What am I gonna have for dinner? And we make macro decisions. Um, when I gave up cigarettes, that was a macro decision. I was no longer a person who smoked cigarettes. So you have to remind yourself of the macro decision. I am a writer. What makes me a writer? Well, I write. So if I'm a person who writes, then I have to simply find the time, make the time, even if it's just scattered about during the day in the odd moments. Um, some time back, I was commissioned to write a novel and I had a full-time job, which was very tiring, a lot of brain work. It was very hard to work on it at night. So I simply set my alarm an hour earlier and that first hour of the day became when I wrote. Um, that's all there was to it. If you're going to be a writer, you will find time to write. And if you can't make yourself write, you have to think about that self-definition, that macro decision. Are you a writer? Well, maybe you aren't. That's a tough one to, to face. But if you are a writer, well, I got to do something about it. You know, I had six years of piano lessons. I'm not a pianist. What's the difference? I don't play the piano. I probably could if I sat down and worked at it. Well, I don't do it. If you're a writer, you're right. You find the time. You make the time. Yeah, can I, I just, I'm not, like you're saying, David, or you, Barbara, I'm not somebody who schedules the way you are uh, suggesting. Um, I get, I think, uh, I come at it a little bit differently. When, when an idea comes, and it's not usually an idea, it's usually a, a line, a phrase, uh, or a question, um, then I will you know, pretty much tell everything else to go away. And that's what I'll do. Um, and I get impatient with myself if I haven't written for a while. And do I get frustrated? You bet, Bio. I mean, same as you, you know, I wish that I could just pick it up and everything would be great. And I wouldn't even have to revise. But I give myself less pressure because I think that uh, revision is really what I'm going for. If I have something down, something, well, then, you know, a day or two or an hour or two or a week later, I can come back and then I can start to revise. Revision is really where it happens. Anybody who thinks that they've got to get this done now quickly and it's perfect is kidding themselves. Um, they really, really are, but at least they've given themselves something to go to, to do the revision. And a schedule is probably a great idea for a lot of people. I don't know what... Uh, I don't know if you all follow the Zodiac much, but my sun sign is cancer. And that is about as unscheduled a sun sign as anybody could have. I had two Capricorn parents who wanted me at all times to have a schedule. And I really sucked at that. So you just gotta kind of find out what your thing is. But for me, it's when the idea comes or the line or the question, then you just say, oh, you know, I'm gonna do this now you know, at least for a while. And um, you have to be comfortable with, I think, uh, you know, not being great. I saw uh, the first draft of a, a poem, a very famous one by Elizabeth Bishop, and it was so unbelievably god awfully horribly bad, um, which is kind of cool because if that poem, which is great, sucked at the beginning, well then we have lots of time to get through revision towards something cool at the, uh, at the other end. 
Thank you so much. Um, that's 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 wonderful. I wish I knew this when I was starting out. Um, I was all over the place. Um, it was like entering a new country, me looking around, like I didn't quite know what was going on. But that didn't stop me from acting like I knew what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, so, Michael Collins, um, I have a question prepared for you also, but I'm going to try to connect it to um, what we've been about. Um, so, part of what your, from what I got from your essays, that it, one of the things that it tries to do is it also tries to help um, beginning writers, your students, um, cope with the blank page, right? Not to be so um, overwhelmed by it. Um, and trying to connect it to what other people have been saying, this idea of revision, um, this idea that we should embrace re revision and all these things. Um, how does the idea of certainty um, play into this? Do you find that when your students sit down with a blank page, they want to be perfect immediately, they want to be certain immediately, they know what they're doing immediately, and how do they um, cope with failure? when they're not, they realize that they can be perfect immediately. The, thank you. Um, the, the first thing to understand about this kind of pedagogical style that's in this essay, if you want to call it an essay, is that I developed it over about 10 years of working with adults who were not writers. Um, some of them were very you know, well-established professionals, and they were now afforded the opportunity to go get their BA. So they were smart people that had a lot of life skills, professional skills, um, but had not been in academia very much. And poetry to them was like another thing, like writing is already scary, and then poetry is like, and then we're gonna go throw, throw the ring in Mount Doom. like another level of scary. So paradoxically, having them write poetry was a great way of making all of the other writing, like just their composition work, seem less scary. But a lot of this pedagogy, like we have to take it all the way back. And some of us may not even remember, like the time before being able to even write a first draft, Never mind scheduling. Just like, I'm gonna actually bother to write down things that I think on paper or I experienced or I sense or whatever, and, and value that in such a way that it's gonna, I'm gonna actually cop to this, you know, like I'm putting these words here. That in itself, like, is, is most of what I'm trying to get around for people with that piece and the others that were like it. Um, so, I don't know, I start talking and I forget the question, so maybe I <laughs> answered it and maybe I didn't. Um, but I do think it's an important piece of context in terms of where I'm coming from. I wasn't ever teaching like students that were like, I'm gonna take a poetry class. This is what I'm self-selecting to do. It was more like, oh, to get my degree, I have to do this. And then, so this was a way of just kind of showing them that they already could do it. Because nothing in my lessons is particularly difficult. It's mostly showing them that poetry is a way that their minds already work. Mm. I love that. I love that so well. <laughs> or can work. My, Michael, I loved uh, that you talked about the associative process because I think that's such a great way to, to let your mind work the way it works. And I think that that was really helpful. It ties into things other people have been saying tonight. Um, I just feel it's important to contextualize my approach because the you know association in poetry is not a new thing for anyone who no, studies right. poetry. It's, you know, we're all doing it. Um, but to somebody who's not familiar, 
right. giving them the experience of like, oh, my associative mind is actually doing something good and not like just getting off task. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. an interesting connection to the, the Buddhist perspective. Was it, was it Barbara brought that up? about meditation because you know in meditation you let the mind wander away and then let it come back it's mm -hmm. kind of a, a similar but opposite permission mm -hmm. like we're going to let the mind wander away and then we're going to think that was cool <laughs> so one of the things that i found so we're going to say something wrong no i'm good no okay so so one of the things that i found to just to reinforce you um just to buttress your point here is that the moment I say that I'm going to write this poem about this, if I have that kind of, you know, structured, um, strictured approach toward my poem, it oftentimes just falls apart. Um, when, when I'm done with it at that time, I might think, yes, I did it. But then <laughs> I come back to it the next morning and I realize I didn't, I don't want to admit that I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah see that to me is that like a second level way of thinking though already like the idea that you can choose to sit down and write a poem presupposes the experience of having done it and that's the gateway for a lot of people that have never read poetry with the idea that they were going to understand it or or god forbid tried to write a poem you have to have the experience of doing that. And then you can say like, oh, I want to write a poem and it's going to kind of look like this. And it's going to be this kind of like meter or line, or whatever. you know, like these are things we think about after we know that we can do it because we've done it before. Um, that's a, that would be a good place to end for tonight. Just a reminder, um, we have the book on sale. Um, it's Far Villages. Um, welcome Essays for New and Beginner Poets. Um, it's on sale with Black Lawrence Press. Um, and all print books are 40% off through this month. Um, Great. So um, we're going to continue next week um, with the second part of our um, focus on, on craft. And we're going to have um, four new contributors who will be talking about this. Um, Diane Gettle, the executive um, editor at Black Lawrence Press, um, will be our moderator. And I'll be here just listening and having a good time with everybody else. Um, so thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks for sharing your time. Thanks for contributing. Your um, this continues to be a humbling experience for me because it keeps taking me back to the person I was at the beginning who had no clue <laughs> what, what, what he was doing. And I hope that we can continue the conversation. So thank you. Thank you.